You're listening to The Jacob Vaux Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Vaux. Here he is. Jacob Vaux. Hello. fans, welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk, and the big news from today in the sports world is that the Miami Marlins have had four more players test positive for the coronavirus. That brings their total to 15 players plus two coaches. Like I said yesterday, we're on a trajectory where we may have to consider canceling or at least pausing the 2020 season. Major League Baseball has not done as good a job of preventing the coronavirus as the NHL and the NBA have. It's just that simple. I don't think we're there yet, but we're on that trajectory. And you know what? Quite honestly, that's all I'm going to say about it. I spoke about it yesterday. I'm not going to repeat myself. If you want to listen to me go more in depth on it, listen to yesterday's show. It's right after I talked about Tom Thibodeau being hired as the next head coach of the Knicks. But the promise I made to you when I started this show was that I'm not going to repeat myself. Unless I really, really have to. I don't think I really, really have to. I think I've kept that promise to you. And I'm going to continue keeping that promise. So instead, I want to talk about Raheem Mostert getting his contract restructured. He did make a trade request, but cooler heads prevailed. This year, his base salary will be $2,575,000, and he will get a $300,000 signing bonus. Also, if he reaches all incentive and bonus benchmarks, he will make an additional $2,750,000. I gotta say... I think this is fair for him. I ripped him a new one for requesting a trade earlier. I didn't think he had earned that right. I still don't think he earned that right. He signed a three-year contract. He balled out year one, and then he wants the contract ripped up? I don't think it works like that. I mean, I knew Mostert wasn't going to be traded, so good job, Jacob, for getting that right. I got Jamal Adams wrong. I got Mostert right. Maybe I should be a Niners fan. (laughs) Can you imagine if I gave up the Jets for the Niners? Oh, my God. Can you say (laughs) frontrunner? No, no, no. I'm sticking with the Jets. As my father says... You stick with your team through thick and thin. But back to Mostert. As we all know, he balled out last year. And the Niners, to their credit, restructured his contract so that he's paid closer to what his production would indicate. They didn't give him an arm and a leg. This is a very fair contract for him. 
If he had signed this contract in free agency, it would have been the steal of the offseason. But given the circumstances, I think this is more than fair for Mostert, more than fair for the Niners. I just don't want to see Mostert if he has another really good year next year pull this same stunt. I don't know if this restructure covers the 2021 season. If it does, he should keep his mouth shut. If it doesn't, well, okay. I don't mind that. I don't think it's a guarantee that Mostert has another really good season. It's certainly possible. In fact, gun to my head, I'd say he will have another really good season, but I don't think it's a guarantee. I don't mind crossing that bridge when we get there, if I'm John Lynch. All right, it's time for decades of Dumbass Decisions. We're on the Sweet 16 now. Specifically, it's where the 1 and 4 seeds would meet if all the favorites advanced. However, as you know, with decades of dumbass decisions, seeding doesn't matter. It was done alphabetically because I didn't want to give you an indication of what I thought was worse. Where's the fun in that? Where's the suspense in that? Starting with the Yankees, we have Javier Vasquez versus the 2004 ALCS. Vasquez gets traded by the Expos to the Yankees in a package headlined by Juan Rivera, who turned out to be a solid outfielder in this league. Not great, but not bad. In 04, Vasquez had a great first half, and then he fell apart in the second half, culminating with him imploding in Game 7 of the 4 ALCS. First pitch in relief of Kevin Brown. Johnny Damon hits a grand slam to basically guarantee the Red Sox the pennant. Vasquez gets traded in the offseason for Randy Johnson. We all think that's the end of his time in pinstripes. Brian Cashman trades for him again in the 2009 offseason. In 2010, Vasquez was somehow even worse than he was in 04. The low light to me is him giving up a home run to Russell Brannion that he hit over my head. And over a lot of people's heads because it ended up in the third or fourth deck. The clip is on YouTube. You should watch it. That's going up against the 2004 ALCS. As we all know, the Yankees became the first and so far only team in Major League Baseball history to blow a 3-0 series lead. Game 4, Mariano on to close the game out. Dave Roberts pinch runs, and the Red Sox come back. Game 5, extra innings, David Ortiz hits the home run. And games 6 and 7, the Red Sox absolutely thumped the Yankees in the Bronx. Javier Vasquez plays into the 2004 ALCS So, with his dreadful performance in Game 7, combined with everything else that happened that series, the 2004 ALCS advances. 
Moving over now to the Islanders, we have the 1989 to 1994 drafts versus Sterling for LaViolette. In 1989, with the second overall pick, the Islanders selected Dave Chizowski. In 1990, with the sixth overall pick, they picked Scott Sissons. In 91, with the fourth overall pick, They selected Scott Lachance. There's a reason you've never heard of those three guys. It's because they are some of the biggest busts in not just Islanders history, but NHL history. In 92, with the fifth overall pick, the Islanders selected Darius Kasparaitis. I never really liked Kasparaitis. I remember watching him play with the Rangers, and I was just never a big fan of his game. He also didn't play very well for the Islanders. His career high in points for them was set in his rookie season, where he had 21 points in 79 games. And then it just went all downhill, and he was traded to the Penguins, along with Andreas Johansson, for Brian Smolinski. A rare instance of a Mike Milbury trade actually working out for the Islanders. In 93, the Islanders go on the magical run, so they have a lower pick, the 23rd overall pick, to be specific, and they would pick Todd Bertuzzi. Nothing against Bertuzzi. He had a really good career, but he would only spend two and a half seasons with the Islanders as he was traded along with Brian McCabe and a third rounder that would ultimately become Yarko Rutu to the Canucks for Trevor Linden. I would much rather have Bertuzzi, McCabe, and Rutu, then Linden. Then in 1994, with the ninth overall pick, the Islanders selected Eric Lindros' brother, Brett. It's easy to see where all the talent in that family went, as Brett only played 51 games in the NHL, scoring only 7 points. That's going up against Sterling for LaViolette. In 2003, Peter LaViolette had led the Islanders to back-to-back postseason appearances. They had a great series against the Maple Leafs in 2002. Then in 2003, they really didn't play well against the Senators. They played well in Game 1. They were okay in Game 3. But games 2, 4, and 5, they were dreadful. Mike Melberry somehow decides that that's Peter Laviolette's fault. On YouTube, there is an interview that he did with Mike and the Mad Dog right after he replaced Laviolette with Sterling. And just listening to it will make your head explode. It's worth listening to, if for nothing else, to understand the bass Ackwards logic that he used. Steve Sterling would only spend one and a half seasons as a head coach in the NHL. In 04, the Islanders made the playoffs, but they got shut out three times by the Tampa Bay Lightning. Then the lockout hit, and Sterling didn't make it out of his second year. He was replaced by Brad Shaw. What did Peter LaViolette do? Oh, nothing much except win a Stanley Cup with the Carolina Hurricanes and become one of the premier coaches in the NHL. See, the thing with evaluating Sterling for LaViolette is you've got to think about how good the Islanders would have been been 
if Laviolette had stayed. In 04, the Islanders would have been more competitive against the Lightning, but I don't think they would have won the series. It would have been more of a respectable loss, but I don't think they would have won. And after the lockout, the 05-06 season, a lot of people got screwed over by that. So, I don't think LaViolette would have made it out of that season. And even if he would have, Milbury was replaced as Islanders GM by Neil Smith and later Garth Snow. So, I don't think LaViolette would have been head coach of the Islanders for a really, really long time. He really only had two more seasons left in him, I think. You take a look at the 89-94 to drafts and what the Islanders could have gotten instead. I mean, I did this in the round of 64. I'll do it again. In 89, the Islanders could have had Bill Guerin. In 90, the Islanders could have had either Daryl Sidor, Darian Hatcher, or Trevor Kidd. If you want to go a little further down, you see guys like Keith Kachuk, Martin Brodeur, and Brian Smolinski. 91, they could have had Peter Forsberg. 92, they could have had Corey Stillman or Martin Straka. 93, they got right. They just gave up on Bertuzzi way too early. Typical Mike Milbury move. And 94, the Islanders could have had Jeff Friesen. I understand you're not going to hit on all your draft picks. But to go through six years of getting really nothing from your first rounders, that beats a boneheaded coaching change. It just does. The 1989 to 1994 drafts are making it to the Elite Eight. It's tough, but I think it's the right decision. Moving on to the Jets, we have Bill Belichick versus Rich Kotite. Belichick was the hand-chosen successor to Bill Parcells when Parcells stepped down as head coach of the Jets. Belichick resigned on a napkin and later went to the Patriots, becoming a future Hall of Famer and arguably the best coach in NFL history. There is no question in my mind that if Bill Belichick had stayed with the Jets, the Jets would have taken Tom Brady, and the Jets would have six Super Bowls. That's going up against Rich Kotite. Kotite replaced Pete Carroll after Carroll went on a really bad losing streak to end his one season as Jets head coach, 1994. That was started by Dan Marino's fake spike. Kotite was a good head coach in Philly, but for whatever reason, it just didn't carry over to the Jets. He went 4-28 and in his two seasons with the Jets. I think that's a 125 winning percentage. I'm not looking at his stats right now. He had a three-win season in 95 and a one-win season in 96. Thank God for the Arizona Cardinals. This one is really tough. Ultimately, I had to think about how sure I was that if Belichick had stayed with the Jets they would have become the Patriots. And, like I said, there's no doubt in my mind that they would have. I did some soul-searching. That's what I came back with. It was close. It was a hard decision. 
But I'm going to say that Bill Belichick resigning advances. Moving over now to the Brooklyn Nets, we have the two worst trades in their franchise's history. The Julius Irving trade versus the Boston Celtics trade. As the Nets were moving into the NBA, they traded Julius Irving to the 76ers for $6 million. And the Boston Celtics trade, we all know it. Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, Jason Terry, and DJ White for a bunch of scrubs and control of four Nets first rounders that the Celtics ultimately used in different fashions on James Young, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, and Kyrie Irving. If you want to be very technical about it, those picks ultimately became Young, Brown, Markel Fultz, and Colin Sexton. The Boston Celtics trade is worse. And the reason is something that I've said before. Roy Bowe, the Nets owner at the time of the Irving trade, really didn't have much of a choice. The Knicks demanded $5 million from the Nets as a territorial fee. Bo initially offered Irving to the Knicks in exchange for waiving the fee. The Knicks turned it down. So that's when the Sixers came into play and the Knicks ended up getting their money. But Julius Irving could have been a Nick. Just imagine Julius Irving being traded from the Nets to the Knicks. Oh, man. If that had happened, maybe, just maybe, that would have advanced. But Bo was left with really no choice but to trade Irving. Yes, he could have gone to a bank to get his money, but trading Irving was obviously a lot easier than getting a $5 million loan. The Boston Celtics trade set the Nets back a lot. It took Sean Marks a while to dig them out of it. The Boston Celtics trade is worse. All right, it's time to go baseball Hall of Faming. I don't know if I've said this before, but that sound effect is someone stepping on a marble floor. I chose that to represent the hallowed halls of Cooperstown. Like you're stepping into a uh, museum. So your steps just echo all throughout the building. I like it. I think it works. The guy who I want to talk to you about is Bobby Wallace. There were a couple guys who I considered taking a metaphorical crowbar to... Guys like Pie Trainer and Chief Bender, to me, are borderline. But Trainer, when he retired, was widely regarded as one of, if not the best third baseman in MLB history. Yes, very few people remember him because of guys like Eddie Matthews and Mike Schmidt and George Brett and Adrian Beltre, and Chipper Jones, and even Alex Rodriguez, if you want to say him. But the simple fact is I have to leave Trainer in because he was so dominant in his era. And Chief Bender was a really, really dominant pitcher. 
He had to overcome a lot of adversity being a Native American. He got called terrible names. He overcame it. Handled it with grace. Won some World Series. It was close for me to leave those guys in, but ultimately, Bender and Trainer can stay. Bobby Wallace cannot. This guy retired with a 268 batting average. He never had a season where he had 180 hits. When he played 1894 to 1918, that was the stat that mattered. No one hit home runs. We have to look at hits, and Wallace just didn't get a Hall of Fame number. He retired with 2,309 hits. That's really good, but that's not Hall of Fame. His defenders will say that he was the best shortstop in the American League from 1902 to 1912, and I agree with them, but it's closer than they'd like you to think. Guys like Freddie Parent and Kid Elberfeld are close to Wallace. They just are. Granted, I would take Wallace over those guys, but it's not Lock, stock, and barrel. Bobby Wallace never won a World Series. Freddie Parent was an integral part of the first World Series winning team, the 1903 Boston Pilgrims. Kid Elberfeld was an excellent leader. So much so that he was a player manager for a little bit for the 1908 New York Highlanders, who later became the Yankees. Granted, terrible manager, but highly respected. It's really, really close. Wallace gets the edge, but it's close. Also, Honus Wagner existed at the same time as Wallace. He was undoubtedly better than Wallace. That's why they say American League. They're taking out, you know, half the competition. And even if I'm taking Wagner out of the equation, Joe Tinker was a really good shortstop for the Cubs. You can make an argument that Bobby Wallace was the fifth best shortstop of his era. That doesn't get you into the Hall of Fame. This guy spent 24 seasons in the majors. He never made a World Series. I have to punish him for that. He was also a compiler. He was a compiler before being a compiler was a thing. The last season where he played 100 games was 1912, when he played exactly 100 games. He wasn't very good. Hit 241, uh, no homers, 31 RBIs, only 78 hits. But still, he played 100 games. He hung around for six more seasons. He got 71 more hits. You may not think there's that much of a difference between 2309 and 2238, Well, there is for the Hall of Fame. At least there is to me. No, I I don't think Bobby Wallace should be in the Hall of Fame. All right, it's time for this day in sports history. On this day... In 1994, Kenny Rogers 
pitched the only perfect game in Texas Rangers franchise history. They started out as the Washington Senators, not the original Washington Senators, the team that started in 1961. They moved to Texas in 1972. And so far, Kenny Rogers has their only perfect game. It was an incredibly dominant performance. Rodgers didn't need any spectacular defensive plays. He just had Angels hitters guessing all day. Not a lot happened in the game except for two innings. In the bottom of the first, Andrew Lorraine was the pitcher for the Angels. You don't need to know anything about him. He really wasn't that good. But he gave up a home run to Jose Canseco with two outs. And then he allowed a manufactured run to score. Will Clark drew a walk. Juan Gonzalez moved him over to second. And Dean Palmer drove him in with a single. And that was all the run support that Rodgers needed. Fast forward to the bottom of the third. Ivan Rodriguez hits a home run on the, not the next pitch, but the pitch after Jose Canseco hit another home run. That made it 4-0 Rangers. That would be the final score Rodgers was incredibly dominant. He struck out eight. Like I said, no incredible defensive plays. Run-of-the-mill fly balls, run-of-the-mill ground outs. He only threw 98 pitches in that perfect game. Think about that. He was just throwing strikes. And the Angels couldn't do anything with it. And that was a good Angels lineup, too. And that had guys like Chad Curtis, Jim Edmonds, Chili Davis, Bo Jackson, J.T. Snow, and Gary DeSarcina. Not going to go through everyone, but those are some solid hitters. They couldn't solve Kenny Rogers. That was, without question the best outing of Roger's career. He never came close to duplicating it. He was traded to the Yankees after the 95 season where he made his first All-Star team. Was absolutely dreadful with the Yankees. Got a World Series ring in 96, but he really didn't deserve it. Pitched terribly. In his one World Series start, went two innings, gave up five runs. And his one start in the ALCS against the Orioles, he was dreadful. Went three innings, gave up four runs. The interesting thing about Rodgers is, as he got older, he got better. In 2004, at the age of 39, Rodgers made the All-Star game. And then he did it again. And then he did it again. He made three straight All-Star games in his age 39 to 41 seasons. That's pretty impressive. But you know what? No outing was as dominant as his outing on July 28th, 1994. Alright, it's time for another Mount Rushmore. We're on the New York Rangers now, and holy moly, was this tough. Not just because I'm an Islander fan, but because, say what you want about the Rangers' lack of success throughout their history, and they've had a really noticeable lack of success. They were an original six team. But they've only won four Stanley Cups. This is their 93rd season. They've only won four Stanley Cups. 
the Islanders have been around for about half that. And they have the same number of Stanley Cups. But for as bad as their history is, the Rangers have had some great players. Roger Bear, Brian Leach, Jean Rattel, Andy Bathgate, Mark Messier, uh, Henrik Lundqvist, Mike Richter, Eddie Jockerman, and Gump Worsley. I mean, you have incredibly dominant players in that group. It was really hard to pick four, but I think I got it right. The correct Mount Rushmore is Rod Gilbert, Henrik Lundqvist, Mark Messier, and Mike Richter. Rod Gilbert was one of the most dominant players of his era from the 60s into the 70s. He's the Rangers' all-time leader in goals and points. He spent his whole career with the Rangers. I'd say it's a shame that he never won a Stanley Cup, but I'm an Islander fan. I don't want them to have any more Stanley Cups. (laughs) Even four is too many. (laughs) I'll tell you, I was rooting for the Kings when Alec Martinez scored that Stanley Cup winning goal. And if I had been alive in 94, I would have been rooting for the uh, Canucks. It's just that simple. I'm not one of those Islander fans that will root for the Rangers. You know, there are uh, some fans like that that'll turn into New York fans if their team is out of it. I'm not one of them. That's my arch rival right there. Gilbert spent his whole career with the Rangers made eight all-star teams, like I said, incredibly dominant. Another guy who's been incredibly dominant is Henrik Lundqvist. You have no idea how much it kills me to sing his praises, but the simple fact is he's a future Hall of Famer. Nick had texted me one night and asked me if I thought Lundqvist was a Hall of Famer. And I said yes. I didn't even have to think about it. And Nick said no. He has no playoff success. Was he ever the best goalie in the NHL? He was in that conversation. I don't know if I would ever put him as the best goalie in the NHL, but I'm certainly biased. I know people who would. I mean, Lundqvist has over 400 wins. 459, to be specific. He's a guy like Tony Esposito. Just played for... I don't know if I can say lousy teams, because the Rangers were in the playoffs, but teams that just couldn't get over the hump. And then I texted Brian Monzo, and I told him what had happened, and uh, Mons texted me back, your friend needs his head examined. (laughs) I mean, you can't say it much better than that. (laughs) Mark Messier was the best player on the 94 Stanley Cup winning Rangers. It wasn't Sergei Zubov. It wasn't Adam Graves. It wasn't Brian Leach. It was Messier. The inspirational leader, the guy who made the guarantee, the captain, beloved figure in New York. In his first season with the Rangers, he won the Hart Trophy. My uncle is a huge Rangers fan, and his wife and children bought him a cameo. From Messier. And Messier was really nice in what he said. He sent me the clip. Did my uncle. I know it made his day. It was for Father's Day, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Father's Day. Messier is a class act. He really is. And Mike Richter, when he played, 
was incredibly dominant. This guy led the NHL in wins in the 93-94 season. The biggest shame of his career is that he just kept getting hurt. He was like Eric Lindros. He spent 14 years in the NHL. He played 666 games. He won 301 of them. If he had stayed healthy, if he had played, you know, 60 games a year for 20 seasons, we'd be talking about Richter as one of the 10 best goalies in NHL history. That's how dominant he was. I remember having these conversations with my father when I was five or six years old. There are some people that would put Brian Leach in the final spot, or Bathgate, or Jacquemin, or Worsley, or Jean Rattel, whoever. I'm putting Richter. He spent his whole career with the Rangers, made three all-star teams, was incredible during their Stanley Cup run, I can understand the argument for putting someone ahead of Richter, but he was so dominant that I have to give him the final spot. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Volk saying that blind people came to the ballpark just to listen to Tom Seaver pitch.